Good day, and welcome to this presentation of And They Sang a New Song, the Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs of the Early Church. The following material was originally presented in several different formats. It was first published as the opening chapter of an undergraduate thesis in 2007. From 2008 through 2010, this material has been presented and modified for use as part of a guest lecture presentation in Dr. Ken Reed's Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs class offered at Cincinnati Christian University. In 2011, this material has received a thorough overhaul focusing on the history of New Testament and patristic hymnody. This was republished as a paper and presented as a concert in November of 2011. If any IWS students from the Epsilon II cohort would like to view any of these printed materials or audio resources, please contact Corey Allen at corey.allen at iws.edu. The materials presented here have been divided into roughly five 45-minute lectures. In this first module, we will look at the New Testament commands for Christians to sing, and we'll focus on Paul's theology of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs as expressed in the text of Colossians 3.16 and Ephesians 5.19-21. Two fundamental questions about these texts will be thoroughly addressed. The first of these questions is this, what kind of material does Paul have in mind when he used the terms psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? Does he see these terms as separate styles with different functions? Or are these terms more synonymous and interchangeable, at least in Paul's mind? The second question deals more with purpose. What does Paul believe such singing spiritually accomplishes? Sing, sang, sung. A word study of the singing terms in the New Testament. Frequently, when beginning a theological discussion, it is necessary to say, what are the words the Bible uses to describe a particular concept? As words will frequently influence both how we interpret the scripture and what to make of it, it is often necessary to say, what are the words that the New Testament frequently uses when it expresses the concept of singing? To begin with, we will start with three of the most commonly used verbs. And by far, the most common of these verbs is the word solo, a verb that is often translated to sing or to praise. This word can have a wider semantic range, however, as the Septuagint, a Greek translation of the Old Testament, uses this word for when a musician plays skillfully on a harp or other stringed instrument. See 1 Samuel 19, 9 for a good example. Coincidentally, this word was also used to derive the noun psalm. This distinction will be important later on in our discussion when Paul uses this construction in Ephesians to make an interesting wordplay where he commands, speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs while soloing singing in your heart to the Lord. <clears throat> it can also be noted here that this term tends to be the most theologically loaded of the New Testament singing words. And by this I mean that this word frequently occurs when the New Testament writer is discussing the theological implications of singing, rather than giving a narrative description and simply noting that somebody did sing. A second common term uh, in the pages of the New Testament is hymno, a verb that is often translated to praise, or when used with a direct object, to sing the praises of. The noun form of this word is where we get our English word hymn, and, it, and the noun version is only used twice in the New Testament, once in Colossians 3.16 and once in Ephesians 5.19. In the Septuagint version of the book of Psalms, it is used nine times, and six of those times it is used to translate a Hebrew term, neganot. Unlike the word solo, this verb only appears in the New Testament in descriptive passages, and by this I mean that this is where the narrative text is describing a character as singing, 
rather than trying to explain the theological significance of such singing. Also, an interesting note, the word neganote, this Hebrew term that hymno is often used to describe, is specifically a word that is used in the introductory sections of the Psalms. It will specifically say this is a neganote of David, for example. And the final verb for consideration is um, the term ado. Most frequently, this term is used by John, the author of Revelation, to describe the singing that he is witnessing in the heavenly worship scene. Like hymno, this term is used mainly in John's narrative passages where singing is described. Now, there is one notable exception to this, and this is where Paul uses the term in Colossians 3. 16. Further examination of the use of the term in the Septuagint does not show much variation in usage of the verb, besides a very basic definition, to sing. Now, in addition to the verbs described previously, three other musical terms, or nouns, are frequently singled out because of the important part that they play in Paul's writings. Scholars note that there are many similarities between Paul's epistles of the Colossians and the Ephesians, and probably nowhere is it more striking than the repeated admonition that Paul gives to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The Colossians text reads like this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and exhorting one another with all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, all with grace in your hearts to God. The Ephesians text reads like this, And do not get drunk with wine, which is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music in your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for each other in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it should be noted that while certainly similar in construction, the Colossians passage is both shorter and contains a slightly different focus from the Ephesians text, with the biggest difference being the Colossians text is focused on letting the word of Christ dwell richly within the believer, whereas the Ephesians text says to be filled with the Spirit and this is specifically opposed to being drunk with wine. Again, this may be splitting hairs, but the Colossians text does seem to be more Christocentric, while the Ephesians text is more Holy Spirit-centered. Now, this will be discussed in detail a bit later, but for now, let it just be noted that Paul repeated this command to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs twice to two different churches using this very specific wording. This would indicate that this is not just a flippant phrase that Paul is using, but a purposeful, if not foundational, teaching that Paul wishes to communicate concerning his theology of worship. As we continue our discussion of the terms psalm, hymn, and spiritual song, we should probably note here that these terms frequently suffer from being transliterated instead of being translated into English. For example, the word samos, the Greek word samos, comes directly into English as psalm. And this has been the trend ever since Jerome did his version of the Vulgate in the 5th century AD. Jerome simply took the word psalmos and wrote the word psalm when he was referring to anything in the book of Psalms or outside of it. Even though he did have a Latin word, carmen, that he could have used instead, Jerome chose to transliterate instead of translate, and that has been the trend with this word ever since. And the result of this today is we're often left to wonder whether or not this word samos, or its original Hebrew counterpart, mizmor, 
whether or not these terms were just generic terms for any kind of song, or whether there is a certain genre question being addressed. Now, most lexicons, both Greek and Hebrew, go with a minimalist interpretation and simply use a word like melody or song. However, the original Greek root came from a word meaning to pluck. And this may indicate that they were trying to say that a mismore, or a psalm, was actually a genre, a type of song played or plucked on a string instrument. Now, also interesting, in my opinion, is the understanding that the word psalm is only used 68 times to describe a particular psalm of music in the Psalter. To be more explicit, the book of Psalms contains 150 psalms. Only 68 of those actually use the designation psalm in their title, approximately one-third of the text. And this could mean that not everything in the book of Psalms is necessarily a psalm. Now, our second term, hymn, or hymnos in the Greek, proves to be a much more rare word in the Septuagint. It only occurs 13 times in all of the book of Psalms. And while exceptions do exist, this term is frequently used to translate the Hebrew term neganote. Now, this is a pretty curious word in English, and frequently it gets translated as a song of taunting. And sometimes it gets translated simply as a song. Now, for me, the most intriguing use of this term is found in Psalm 72. At the end of the psalm, most English translations read something to this effect. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are now ended. See the New American Standard Bible for this translation. However, in the Septuagint, the verse is rendered like this. Thus ends the hymns of David, the son of Jesse. Now, this does raise a very real and interesting possibility that the term hymn, at least as it could have been understood by Paul, who did routinely use the Septuagint when he was doing scripture quoting, could refer to simply any song written by David. Now, our final term, ode, where we get the word ode from, is frequently translated as song. And this is quite possibly the most generic of Paul's three terms. And in the Hellenistic culture, this would have been the word that was frequently used to simply describe any kind of song they could imagine. Now, this term does occur more frequently than the hymn term. Hymn only occurred 13 times in the Septuagint. Ode occurs 43 times. And it is frequently used to translate a specific Hebrew term. Sheer, which also is a very vague term that means song. Now, because this term is so vague, Paul feels the need to modify it in both Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16 with an adjective, spiritual. Now, because of this noun adjective construction, many commentators have offered a wide variety of interpretations throughout the years. A minimalist position would simply note that the term ode is used to describe the songs of ascent. Psalms 120 through Psalm 133 all begin with the title, A Ode of Going Up. And so, the, nom- the minimalist position would simply say that the term refers to those specific psalms. Now, more charismatic commentators will tend to find in this term an impromptu kind of singing, one where maybe even the singer is being controlled by the Spirit and doesn't even have full control over their tongue. Now, moderate and commentators who find themselves in the middle allow for such songs to be composed under the volition of the singer but they would stress the newness or the originality of such pieces, though not necessarily their charismatic origin. 
So now, at this point, it is fair that we can ask the question. So what kind of singing did Paul have in mind when he told the Ephesians and the Colossians to sing with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? As I have been hinting at for the past few slides, these terms can be interpreted in many different ways. And depending on interpretive choices, a person can come to some radically different conclusions. Of the possibilities, three make exegetical sense to me, meaning that a person could build a strong, solid argument using just the biblical text and support any one of these three positions. Now, this first position we're going to call the minimalist position. And in this position, all three terms are completely interchangeable. The result is often a singing tradition that will only sing from the book of Psalms. Many reformed groups, such as the Presbyterians, Pious, and really any reformed church that places a lot of weight on the book, John Calvin's Institutes of Religion, uh, any of these groups have historically embodied this position, although, quite frankly, it is rather rare in English-speaking countries today. Now, a second position is what I'll call a bifid, or two-term system. In this model, the term hymns and spiritual songs are interchangeable and refer to songs composed by Christians in the New Testament era and afterwards while the term psalms explicitly refers to the materials in the book of psalms. This tends to be the default for most Protestants in the West, as they routinely make a distinction between psalms and hymns, but they are rare to discuss uh, and differentiate between hymns and spiritual songs. Now, a third position is frequently taken by charismatic groups, and we'll simply call this the charismatic model. In this model, each term is unique and refers to a different manifestation of the Spirit. Psalms are often understood as the biblical worship materials, including the book of Psalms itself, while hymns are understood as non-canonical writings that were intentionally composed and preserved by Christians while a third genre, spiritual songs, are consequently understood by charismatics as manifestations of the Spirit, and may or may not include singing in tongues, or more um, exactly, singing in the Spirit. So, we may now ask the question, which of these three positions is correct, or at least which of these three positions is best? Well, I will leave that up to you to decide after you finish hearing this presentation, but for now, let us go through the three positions and at least give them the benefit of the doubt and hear them in their own terms. First, we will discuss the minimalist position. Now, throughout the Christian age, there have been several notable movements that have attempted to limit the singing of Christians to the Psalms and only the Psalms. Now, one of the earliest examples of this we can find is from the Council of Laodicea in 363 AD, which restricted the singing to only scripture and specifically prohibited the composition of new psalms by private individuals. Here is the quote from Canon 46. No psalm is to be composed by a private individual, nor should any uncanonical books be read in the church save only the canonical books of the Old and the New Testaments. Now, this will not be a unique occurrence. John Calvin will echo this sensibility nearly 1,200 years later when he limited the singing in Geneva to the Psalms and the few song-like materials known as the Canticles. Again, all material from the Bible and the Bible only. In most of these case, cases, the prohibition seems to have come about as a direct response to real or perceived heresy. In order to keep dissenting ideas from being propagated, many of these reformers and early church fathers concluded that the only way to ensure doctrinal purity is that you can only sing the words that God has given his church. And what are those words, they argue? They are found in the scriptures. So, we may now ask the question, 
which of these three positions is correct? Or at least, which of these three positions does the most justice to what Paul was trying to get at in Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16? While I'll leave this decision up to you as to which one is actually the best, let us, for the moment, at least go through these three positions and try to hear them in their own terms. The first of these positions we'll discuss is the minimalist one. Now, the strength of the minimalist position, though it is currently not in vogue anywhere in English-speaking countries that I can think of, is that it does take the text of Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16 very seriously. As noted on the previous slides, all three terms, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, are used in the titles of over two-thirds of the text of the Old Testament Psalter. Their argument is simply to say, all three terms can be referring to something we find in the book of Psalms. Therefore, Paul is saying, sing the book of Psalms. Now, one benefit of this position is that it trusts in the text of Scripture more than it trusts human musical innovation. And it does not bear the burden of proof that these terms, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, could mean anything else. Additionally, because it is almost the default understanding that the psalms are inspired by the Holy Spirit, see Acts 4.25 and 2 Peter 1.20, this model also provides the church with a sure foundation for singing and worship that will not produce heresy. Finally, such a position also shows a form of humility that is seldom seen today, as minimalists do not think too highly of their own inspiration or creativity by the Holy Spirit, at least when compared with the inspired prophets and the apostles. Such a position would say, who am I to write a new song when the inspired prophets, the inspired apostles have already written us plenty of songs? Now, there are several weaknesses as well, and the biggest is, at least in my opinion, is that this position does not take seriously that in the New Testament, authors like Luke, John, and Paul all include non-psalmic materials in their writings. And this would seem to indicate that the first generation of Christians wrote original devotional worship materials. To say that the leading of the Holy Spirit was present with the apostles, but yet was somehow absent from the later church, tends to strike most Westerners as foolish, if not insulting to the continued work of the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, this position discourages personal expressions of faith and creativity, which many opposed to the minimalist view see as the... Um, as a natural result in a per of a personal relationship in Jesus Christ. To put this another way, detractors of this view would say, if you have a relationship with Christ, you're going to be creative as your faith expresses itself. You can't tell a person not to write a hymn. And finally, the biggest difficulty is implementing this view in modern musical paradigms. Because you see, Baroque sensibilities about music involve time signatures, meter, harmony. And let's be honest, the Psalms do not follow time signature. They do not follow meter. They're poetic expressions of a Hebrew culture, not an English rhythmic culture. And... This is why, throughout the course of history, many people who found themselves in the minimalist camp ended up composing not original material per se, but these things known as paraphrases or uh, metrizations of the psalms. Often these were called metrical psalms. And the result is that you would have many strong advocates for psalm singing, such as Isaac Watts, who had to experiment with these metrical paraphrases. And they would do this so that these psalms would actually fit into the standard musical conventions of the day.
Now, this is ultimately proven to be the death blow of most psalmody singing in English. Because once you allow for a paraphrase, an individual expression, it is really only a matter of time before the original devotional materials begin being produced by such poets as well. Moving on to the second position, this second view, or the bifid view, has probably been the most prevalent throughout Christian history. In the bifid view, the Book of Songs are taken as an inspired source material for singing and can serve as a template for the composition of new material, frequently called hymns or spiritual songs. The biggest difference between the bifid view and the more recent charismatic view is that there is no attempt made to differentiate between what constitutes a hymn and what constitutes a spiritual song. To use Martin Luther as an example, in 1524 he wrote to his friend Spolatin, and he writes this, I wish also that we had as many songs as possible in the vernacular, which the people could sing during the Mass, until a time comes when the whole Mass can be sung in the vernacular. But alas, poets are wanting from among us, or are not yet known. Who could compose such evangelical and spiritual songs, as Paul calls them, and be worthy to be used in the Church of God? Unquote. So, what we see here is Luther calls for people to compose spiritual songs. Now, when we actually look at the hymnal that was produced from this call a few years later, Luther will go through this hymnal, and in its introduction, he will call all the pieces organized therein hymns, and he will not use the term spiritual songs. And all of this is simply to say that Luther and many others who follow the same line of thought really only classify two types of worship song, a psalm and a spiritual hymn song, i.e. they make no distinction between a spiritual song and a hymn. So what are the pros and cons of the bifid position? Well, one of the biggest strengths of the bifid position is that it has a hyper-awareness of the individual. Salvation was preached and experienced at the individual level in most of these early Protestant denominations, and the practice of hymn writing followed suit. A Catholic detractor of this named George Witzel uttered in the preface of a hymnal in 1547 where he said, There was scarcely a pastor or shoemaker, however incompetent, who had not composed at least one or two little songs for over his pipe, and afterward would sing these with the peasants in his church. Unquote. Now, while Weitzel's critique will be dealt more with the weaknesses of this position, his observation was profound. Everyone was writing hymns in northern Germany, as far as he could tell. They were taking Luther's doctrine of the priesthood of all believers seriously, and they were stepping up to fulfill that role, even musically. Furthermore, the bifid position takes the continued role of the Holy Spirit seriously as well. Many hymns composed since the dawn of the Protestant Reformation have moved souls to comfort, to salvation, and to holiness. And this has ultimately proven to be one of the greatest objective measures for the continued work of the Holy Spirit. And by this I mean, when you see the singing of hymns, even though they are not scripture per se, we see lives transformed by this practice. And we realize God's Holy Spirit is in this work. But there are weaknesses with this as well. Once a denomination or even an individual congregation has allowed for individuals to compose their own worship material, the question of correct doctrine instantly comes to the forefront. How do we know when a song has been inspired by the Holy Spirit? How much does a song have to be based on an existing biblical passage or use biblical language even? 
Most American and British hymnals, not to mention most of the songs in the CCLI Top 50, suffer from this sort of what I'll call doctrinal schizophrenia, because you can find a Calvinist and an Arminian piece side by side. You can find dispensational, post-millennial, amillennial theology all within the same work. And a whole slew of other opposing theologies frequently coexist within the same hymnal. Or, even more awkward, they can be performed within the same worship set. Now, a further danger can be uh, when a hymn is elevated to a canonical status. And I'll use an example from my uh, undergraduate days. My professor, Ken Reed, frequently asked this question using Amazing Grace as a template. So, this Sunday, Psalm 137 or Amazing Grace, what are we going to sing? Psalm 137 is angry and vengeful. Amazing Grace is uplifting and edifying. Psalm 137 makes people very uncomfortable. Amazing Grace makes them delight in their salvation. Psalm 137, however, bears God's official stamp of approval as scripture. Amazing Grace, at least by as of 2013, has yet to be canonized. And yet, we pick Amazing Grace over Psalm 137 routinely because one fits our Protestant agenda and Psalm 137 does not. Now, all of this is to say that in the bifid position, many, many remarkable hymns will have been written. Many of them are more memorized and better loved than some pieces of scripture. And this does raise the very real question, should this be the case? Now, moving on, the third position we will refer to as the charismatic position. Garrett Gustafsson, in the 20 Centuries of Christian Worship, uh, on page 311, describes it as this. A practice unique to the charismatic movement is singing in the Spirit, based on 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15. This practice involves singing spontaneous words and melodies around a fixed chord or a slowly moving chord progression. The spontaneous quality of worship, along with a renewed desire for personal experience in worship, has created a burgeoning new library of contemporary choruses. So, with the rise of charismatic and Pentecostal styles of worship, a third view has recently been added to the interpretation of what psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs could mean. And this is namely that these three terms are unique, <clears throat> and that the third form, the spiritual song, can only be unlocked through a moving of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. It should be stressed that while this position may be taken for granted uh, by many influenced by the contemporary and charismatic worship movements, it is a relatively new assessment of what Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16 mean. I have been in, unable to find any literature on this kind of singing in the Spirit, i.e. as a miraculous spiritual gift, any time before 1960. Thus, this phenomenon is strongly tied with the full gospel argument of apostolic restoration. In most Pentecostal circles, the assertion is usually that this form of singing was practiced by Jesus and the apostles, but within the next few generations, it was lost and has only recently been recovered. As with the bifid model, the term psalms is taken to mean the book of psalms, and hymns are acknowledged to be the body of hymns that have been handed down through history, although it is rare, at least in my experience, to find charismatics or Pentecostals who sing in the spirit and also utilize this older body of psalmody and hymnody in their worship. Now, there are several strengths to this charismatic position, with probably the biggest being that it is one of the few positions that fully take the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers and try to take it to its logical conclusion. This charismatic position takes the doctrine 
And it says, when a man or woman is moved by the Holy Spirit, they will worship. And they are all on even footing. Therefore, anyone can contribute to the worship. And since many charismatic churches have few guidelines concerning what proper turn-taking etiquette would look like, this allows that even multiple people can sing about numerous and varied topics, sometimes even on top of each other's singing, and this doesn't cause too much of a fuss. Indeed, this may be one of the few interpretations of Ephesians 5.19 that also allows for 1 Corinthians um, 1 Corinthians 14.26 to be true, that each brings a song. Another freeing aspect of this model is that it places less emphasis on technical proficiency. A person does not have to be a trained musician or a skilled poet in order to bring their song. Indeed, it is very, we'll call it uh, egalitarian in that Everybody is permitted to participate, and if at least done correctly, everybody has equal value in bringing their song. Now, there are a few weaknesses as well. One is that I have not attended many charismatic churches that actually utilize the other two forms, psalms and hymns. Almost all of their singing is exclusively this spiritual song. In general, the preference is given to singing new songs or spiritual material, uh, which has led other people like IWS's Daryl Harris to refer to these kind of songs that they create as disposable worship songs. And by this, here's what he means. When I was first introduced to the spiritual songs of the charismatic movement, artists like Keith and Melody Green were all the rage. A little bit later, in the 90s, Darlene Check really couldn't fail to deliver when it came to writing worship music. But now, most of their music sounds rather dated to most worshipers. And I know many worship leaders who will actively avoid playing these older songs because they fear it will kill the mood. In short, very few of these new spiritual songs have proven to have any real staying power in the world market of Christian worship. And the few that have become classics are often relegated to the same bin as hymns, i.e. they are dusted off for nostalgia's sake for homecoming Sundays, but they rarely are attributed moving power more than a decade after their composition. And this strikes me as odd that the Holy Spirit would move and then after a few years, maybe a decade, that such music, such movements of the Spirit would suddenly no longer have any real relevance. So, selecting a mode. Let's return to the question one last time. So which of these three modes best describes what Paul actually had in mind? Well, 10 or 15 years ago, I would have told you that the charismatic mode was the best, and I would have told you so without a second thought, nor would I have taken time out to have considered your feelings or your tradition. And, as a result, I led many, many worship services that were aimed at blending these three genres of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs as they were defined by the charismatic model. And, to be honest, at the time, I felt really good about it. Now, 15 years later, I'm not as sure. For me, I have come to understand that all three modes have something to offer. And I'm no longer quick to make a genre distinction. The dichotomy of what constitutes a hymn versus a spiritual song has become progressively more nebulous for me as the songs that I would have called spiritual songs when they were new and fresh have all but been relegated to the status of hymn in that they've been published, they've been overplayed, they've been mass marketed, they've been, you know, they've changed and survived the vicissitudes of changing musical scruples over the past 20 years. In short, I now find myself relating more to the Bifid camp these days. 
with the caveat that I do lean some days towards the charismatic side and on few days even towards the psalmody side, especially when I hear newer music being created if it contains bad doctrine. You know, nothing says we should return back to the songs of the Bible and only the Bible more than hearing a bad poet, a bad musician, say things that are just untrue and pass it off as a Christian worship song. And as for Paul, what did St. Paul originally mean when he said sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? Well, when I first went to seminary, my goal was to study Greek and to read these things for myself. And I can say after 10 years of studying Greek, I don't know. Most of the scholars, when they even begin their discussion of this passage, start by noting just how difficult it is to assert what does Paul mean by this. And they also show it is very easy to push a preconceived theological question on this, or sorry, a preconceived theological agenda on this question. And by this I mean if you're inclined to follow the charismatic model already, you'll read this like the charismatic model. If you're inclined towards the psalmody model, you'll read it like the psalmody model. And I think for me that this was the part of the study that was most eye-opening, that of all three of these interpretations, while each one tries to take the Bible seriously, in the end they are all interpreting Paul's commands through the lens of what they're already inclined to do. And this is something to think about, because when the scripture is vague, can we or should we make demands? And so, at least for now, I am comfortable with this, what I'll call, modified bifid position, which is that I think that there are really two kinds of songs. Songs in the Bible, and songs written that are not yet canonized. That both can be edifying, and they all have their place in Christian worship. And I think for me to say more than that is to really push an agenda that I'm not certain on above and beyond where I currently am. So, for my two cents, that's where I'm currently at on selecting which of these three modes is best. So, if we can change gears for a second, now that I've thoroughly muddied the waters on what kind of song Paul wants us to sing, let's move on to a different theological question. What does Paul think singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs actually accomplishes? And as with the previous question, many commentators and Greek experts are very quick to argue, and there's no less than four views that exist. Now, for the best discussion on this matter, and it's nearly 60 pages long, I will refer you to a book by Barry Leash entitled The New Worship, Straight Talk on Music and the Church, produced by Baker Books, first in 1996, and then an expanded edition was reprinted in 2001. Now, what will follow here on the next few slides is a digest of that position by Barry Leash, and it will hopefully avoid all of the Greek grammatical minutia and problems, which, as anyone who's ever studied grammar knows, it's boring. As we start taking steps towards articulating a theology of singing, we should note that the four views that are expressed on Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16 are often based on grammar. And they're based off of the specific problem that the Greek New Testament does not contain punctuation. And because it does not contain punctuation, the modern interpreters have suggested a wide variety of ways of punctuating Paul's famous command to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And the question largely revolves around how does the command to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs relate to the material that comes before and after it. Now, there are four prevalent views 
two of which are extremely common, and the fourth view, which is uh, preferred by Barry Leash and others, is not so common that you will find it in modern translations. So let us look at them for what they're worth. The first of these is what is known as the imperative view. And to keep things simple, we'll simply use Colossians 3.16 as the example because, well, it's shorter. And quite frankly, I, you'll get to the same conclusion using either text. But the imperative view would say that there is no connection in the command to, do, to let the word of Christ dwell richly in the believer with the later command that the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs are to be sung. NASB does it like this. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you in all wisdom. Semicolon. Break. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Semicolon. Another break. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So in summary, in this imperative view, a person can let the word of Christ dwell in them without singing, i.e., I can be fully letting the word of Christ dwell richly in me, but I could be disobeying the command to teach and admonish with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. That's the imperative view. Now, the second view is what is known as the attendant emphasis view. And in this, the clauses of teaching and admonishing and the clauses of singing are loosely connected and are frequently connected using the word as or while to a primary command. And in this case, the primary command would be to let the word of Christ dwell within you richly. The secondary clauses are, of course, to sing and to teach, and they are subordinated by what is called a attendant emphasis particle. And this article in most translations like the NIV is as, although a few translations will use the word while. NIV reads it like this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. So, in summary, the attendant emphasis view would say that singing, teaching, and admonishing are all things you do while you follow the command to let Christ the word of Christ dwell in you richly, meaning that they are secondary considerations of the primary command to let the word of Christ dwell in you. Moving on, our third possible interpretation is known as the resultive emphasis interpretation. Now, I will admit this is one of the more rare interpretations, and the only reason I'm including it is because a fairly major Greek scholar named Peter O'Brien um, holds to it pretty fast. In the resultive emphasis model or interpretation, teaching and admonishing with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs are the result of letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So in one sense, it is very similar to the second interpretation. Here's the way Peter O'Brien phrases it in his Colossians commentary on page 207. As the word of Christ richly indwells the Colossians, so by means of its operation, they will teach and admonish one another in all wisdom by means of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The teaching, admonishing, and singing all in all wisdom arise from the indwelling of the word. Now, the summary of this would simply be that if you are letting the word indwell you, the result will be that you teach, admonish, and sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Um, so there is a stronger connection and Barry Leash at least finds this to be somewhat plausible, but he prefers still a fourth model. And that final view is the instrumental emphasis view. This view is fairly prominent among many what I'll call A-list scholars. Um, commentators such as Gordon Fee, Clint Arnold, Murray Harris, and 
H.A.W. Meyer, all of these uh, pretty big name Greek scholars all agree that the instrumental emphasis is probably what Paul has in mind. Now, in the instrumental emphasis view, the word of Christ indwells a believer by means of teaching, admonishing, and singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And the operative word of all this is by means of. Now, while a discussion of why this last view makes the most grammatical sense would be way too cumbersome for this presentation, I will say that I did find that it was pretty compelling the way that Leash presented the argument. Um, I will also say that I personally find uh, this uh, position to have the most uh, benefit in pushing a believer to action that their singing actually accomplishes something. The first of the three positions really don't give much emphasis that the singing accomplishes something. In fact, it is a, it is a byproduct, as it were, of letting the word of Christ dwell in you. In this fourth model, uh, what we actually see is that the word of Christ indwells primarily because, by means of, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, as well as teaching and admonishing. And I personally find that this has many potential benefits of a theology of singing, because it is the most proactive of saying this singing actually produces something palpable. So, in conclusion to this first opening module, while the matter is still very far from being closed uh, concerning which of these four views is best, I would like to fully pursue the implications of the instrumental emphasis view because ultimately it places the worship leader and the simple worshiper in the congregation into a context that is both spiritually rich and challenging. So here's the first benefit. For starters, if the instrumental emphasis view holds up, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs becomes a direct conduit by which we unlock the Spirit's power. In the Colossians text, singing becomes the means of letting the Word of Christ dwell within the believer richly. And in its parallel passage in Ephesians 5, 18-20, the admonition is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This very likely means that Paul expects a sacramental encounter when a person sings psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. If we may use presence language for a second, it means that when we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, the presence of Christ dwells within us. The filling of the Holy Spirit in, it fills us. I like this idea because it says singing is a means by which we commune with Christ and the Holy Spirit. And you really don't get that in the other three. The other three, simply singing is a byproduct of this communion that you already have. But if the fourth view, if the instrumental emphasis is correct, then singing could rightly become a sacramental function in and of itself. A second intriguing possibility of this uh, instrumental emphasis goes like this. Because the Colossian text ties singing intimately together with teaching and admonishing, it becomes necessary to assert that church music should have both a didactic and an edifying purpose. As a personal critique of church music that I've seen produced in the last 20 years, I have noticed that it frequently does a great job with edification. But it has very little focus on what I'll call teaching doctrine. 
Now this will be discussed in great length in modules 2 and 3 as I present the history of hymn singing. But for now, it will suffice to say that the church has a very long 2,000 year history of writing hymns and singing the Psalms, and they do so in such a way that they teach sound doctrine. And I personally fear that this aspect of church singing is being ignored by most modern contemporary paradigms. And it will be a challenge for us, those of us at IWS who have studied worship music, to revitalize this tradition, that it should have two functions, teaching and edifying, and that we shouldn't try to shift too far in one direction or the other. Both should be a goal. And finally, I was struck by how the Ephesians and the Colossians texts use the phrase, one another, when they command Christians to sing. Paul seems to be envisioning a communal ritual where the people sing to each other. And this is important for me because I have served in many churches where the music was mixed in such a way that a person could not hear even the person singing beside them, if indeed they could even hear their own voice when they sang. Another result is that many churches are lamenting that the congregations, uh, that they tend to watch the worship now instead of fully participating, especially in these contemporary churches where the music is loud, polished, and easy to get lost into as a entertainment or as a observer. Now, both of these practices just worship as observing or as entertainment and worship as something I sing just to God, but not necessarily to one another. Both of these practices seem very foreign to Paul's command if we take his one another language seriously. In this way, if we were to reformat our singing to better come in line with this aspect, we would do well to employ methods that highlight congregational singing and specifically reinforce the duty of a individual believer to edify one's neighbor with their song. I find this to be a charming idea because more and more I am becoming skeptical of the private worship moment. Those moments of being slain in the spirit because they seem very distant from what this passage seems to be getting at, which is the purpose of singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs is to edify one another, is to teach one another. And if I am having my private moment, am I doing either of those? I like this because it has a picture of interactivity. It has a picture of a church worshiping together, learning together, ministering together. And quite frankly, I want to worship in that kind of a church. I want to be in that kind of church. I want that kind of a church experience for others. And so for me, that is the strongest aspect, in my opinion at least, of the instrumental emphasis, is it focuses on the one another aspect that singing unlocks something very spiritual both between us and God and between us and each other. And that is exciting. I like this theology of singing primarily because it says singing accomplishes something, which I think if we were to think about it clearly, we've known intuitively for a very long time that singing is powerful, that singing unlocks something deep within us. And I think that that is the strength of this in, in, instrumental emphasis view.
that it acknowledges what we seem to already know intuitively, that singing is powerful. It can be a conduit to unlocking spiritual realities. But at the same time, it can also become a very vital tool for teaching and uplifting one another. 